This is the most expensive, most feature-packed, and also heaviest 3D printer I've ever checked out. This is the Chidi X-Max 3. I think this might have the most impressive specs list of any 3D printer I've ever checked out. So first off, let's cover the specs. But before we get to the specs, a huge thanks goes out to ZBank for sponsoring this video and sending out this printer for me to check out. Now let's talk about this printer. It comes with clipper out of the box. It's got a core XY structure. So they say it can print at speeds up to 600 millimeters per second, flow rate of 35 millimeters cubed per second, and acceleration of 20,000 millimeters per second squared. It's got a huge build volume of 325 millimeters by 325 by 315 millimeters tall. It comes with a solid six millimeter aluminum bed, so it takes a while to heat up, but once that bed gets to temperature, it's gonna stay at that temperature. And while it comes with an enclosed chamber like a lot of other 3D printers I've checked out, this is the only one I've checked out that comes with a heated chamber. It's a little extra heater and a fan that helps you get to a higher temperature way quicker and stay at that really stable temperature. Super important for more high-end engineering grade materials. Materials. This can print all your normal materials like PLA, PETG, TPU, like you can print on pretty much any 3D printer, but also a few higher temperature ones like ABS and ASA, but this one even reaches into the more extreme engineering grade ones like PC, Ultra PA, and Nylon. It comes with a large gear extruder, which they say is a 9.5 to 1 gear ratio. I was able to get TPU printing beautifully out of this. Not super fast, but it was successful. It comes with a dual-sided PEI bed, which worked great on a lot of the normal filaments, and then with some of the more challenging prints, a little bit of glue stick goes a long way. The internal structure is all metal with two lead screws and four guide rods moving the bed up and down. The external housing, on the other hand, is all plastic. A plastic door and plastic top cover. It's kind of nice because it won't get broken. It feels cheaper than something like the K1 Max, but I've also broken the K1 Max's door before. So it's a give and take between more premium feeling materials, but also more dangerous and easy to break materials. There is a large internal auxiliary cooling fan, which helps a lot to cool down prints and get really good overhangs on these, especially on these high temperature filaments. It levels using a BL touch style probe, and you do need to use a sheet of paper to set your Z offset the first time. That's not quite as advanced as some other printers, which are now using load cells to do that Z offset automatically. I also like that this printer comes covered in warning labels and little instructions of how to do things correctly. It comes with a film dry box which can be installed onto the back of the printer which is great for a lot of filaments which can't handle much moisture. Some filaments like nylon or even TPU can print better if they're printed directly out of a dry box. So this comes in the box ready to go. It comes with a large touch screen on the front with a lot of features here, being able to navigate around, starting prints. It shows off a large picture of what you're about to print, also the material this was sliced with, how long this is gonna take, how much material it needs to print with, and you can turn on or off the bed level and calibration. For a premium printer, it is nice to see a lot of accessories coming in the box. There's a quick start guide, there's several packs of desiccant for the drying box on the back, crescent wrench, large screwdriver, ethernet cable, and a large scraper. Normally they all look the same between printers, this one actually looks unique. A few screws, and a fuse for the power plug that goes on the back of the printer. The big thing that's unique on this printer is that it comes with an entirely separate hot end with a hardened steel nozzle in there. The stock one is a plated copper nozzle and then this one is a hardened steel nozzle. For if you're using a lot of abrasive filaments, they do advertise a lot of carbon fiber or glass filled filaments. So you're gonna be wanting to use this nozzle. The normal plated copper nozzle will have better heat conduction. So better for normal filaments that aren't very abrasive. It is nice when companies give you a fair amount of filament like this. They, it's weird that they don't list what type of filament it is. I would guess PLA. I do like that this printer has a lot of instructions all over it to help you get going. That way you don't need to find the manual just to figure out how to install the dry box. Now we can talk about print quality. And this printer really is top notch when it comes to great looking prints, especially when it comes to high temperature printing. I guess we'll start with PLA because that's what we always start with. This is the pre-sliced 15 minute Benchy. Turned out great, especially for how quickly it printed it. The one issue this printer struggles with is seams. You can see on the back of the boat here that the seam is kind of jagged right there. It comes out more obviously on these bigger prints where it's just a large cylinder of a print and the Z seam does stand out right there. It's just one defect that does show up on all these prints whenever you don't have a sharp corner to hide the seam on. When it comes to other PLA prints, here's one of their logo. Turned out really good looking. 
This is one of my favorite test prints because in the end, you get a trophy if it's successful. It prints in place like this, then you unscrew the bottom, then flip it around and screw it back into itself. It's a lot of good stringing tests with these spikes on here and tolerances with the screw being able to unscrew and re-screw together. It does suffer from a little bit of stringing on here, but it is the wispy kind of stringing, so a little bit of rubbing with your finger and it just disappears. But you can use a lighter or just, honestly, your fingers helps remove it really quickly. It's not bad stringing, it's just a lot of the, that spider web type wisping. It could be an issue with moisture in this PLA, because it didn't show up on the first Benchy I printed. And then a few weeks later when I printed this trophy, it did show up. I printed a ton of these. These are spool rings for cardboard spools. If you've got a cardboard spool like this and a spool holder that holds it in the middle here, this helps sort of a friction fit in there and helps it slide a lot easier around there. This is something that would be really easy to warp on a large build volume like this, and I used it corner to corner. So this is just proof that the heated chamber really is working well to print high temperature filaments. Next up, I got some TPU to work, and this is the only one I had to adjust the settings in the slicer. I did get a little blob that got stuck in there on that side, but the other side turned out beautifully. It's nice and bendy, flexible, exactly what you want out of a TPU print. I could probably clean it up even more with a little more tweaking, but this is a really good torture test to show that it doesn't round out these sharp corners on the inside, and there's also no stringing across the middle of the inside. I printed some ABS, that was successful, and then all of these in ASA. These are all printed in Polymaker ASA, and I normally struggle a lot with Polymaker ASA. These are especially difficult because they're so tall and narrow. I did print them with a brim on the bottom, but they're printed vertically like that, very tall. Any amount of warping on the base here would have easily tipped it over, but they all turned out beautifully, perfectly. These are pool noodle swords, so you can screw a pool noodle onto these threadings on the top, and they make great for pool parties, great for whacking each other. It even works well on threaded prints like this. You can unscrew it, screw it back together really easily, right off the printer. The tolerance has worked out great. So when it comes to print quality of their default slicer, I'm impressed. I think it turned out great. The only problem is the Z seam, and that might be something you can tweak out later. But I like to test these in stock configuration, and all the materials worked for me so far. TPU is the only one that needed a little bit of tweaking. Now this printer does have some downsides, and it's time we talk about the things I really didn't like. This menu is decently easy to navigate around, but not as good as normal clipper screen. I don't really know why the home screen is just an ad for this printer. It says it's Core XY and the max speed it can print at, and it's based on clipper, it has a chamber heater, and it even lists the SOC processor that this machine is currently using. These aren't useful to someone who has already bought the printer. This is something you put on the web page to help sell the printer. So one odd complaint I have about this printer is that it's kind of too big of a printer. It's very large on a table like this. The flash drive to load memory is back here which is kind of a reach for me, I'm tall. This is a tall table. I don't know what table you're planning on putting your printers on. All of my printer tables are this tall. Just because I'm a tall person, I like them up at this height. But for a large printer like this, this is something you just need to think about before getting this printer. It's not a downside, it's just it won't fit in an apartment very easily. The other downside with it being so big is loading filament. The filament spool is around on the back. Especially if you're using the filament dry box, this is kind of a difficult thing to open up. Open all four, fit the spool in there, feed the spool filament all the way through, and then feeding it through while you're navigating and using the front screen to load filament. It's something you can't really do without access to the back of the printer. On smaller printers, it's really not that bad to rotate it around, but this is a 66 pound printer. So moving it and shifting it around, it's doable to like slide it around a little bit. It's just not something that's easy or enjoyable to do. On most other printers, I don't mind changing filament. On the bamboo printers, they're so easy to change filament. The K1 printers, I really enjoy it because of how I have it set up. This printer, I've avoided swapping filament as much just because I don't want to deal with it. Another problem with changing filament is how the screen is laid out here. There's an unload button here, but if you don't have the nozzle already at temperature, it will just tell you, hey, the nozzle's not ready to retract. With most other printers, if you tell it to retract filament, it will heat it up to the correct temperature and retract that filament. So it's just an extra annoying step. You've got to turn it on, tell it what temperature you want it to heat up to, sit here while it heats up, 
because it's not going to automatically retract after it gets to temperature. On the K1, I think has a, one of my favorite systems. You just click retract, it will heat it up to temperature, retract the filament, and then cool down the nozzle. This one does none of that. It's very manual hands-on. First I told it what temperature to go up to, then I can click unload, and it will go through the unload pr process, retracting filament, then I've got to manually tell it to cool back down to zero again. All while you're reaching around the back of the printer here and pulling the filament out through the Bowden tube. And then to reload filament, if you still have it at temperature, you don't have to mess with it, but you need to be around back of the printer and feeding it up through a reverse Bowden tube all the way through the cable chain and to the nozzle, and then telling it to start retracting here on the front. And you've got to press it a few times. It only goes up to 50 millimeters of extrusion at one time. So when it comes to 3D printers that can handle engineering grade materials and a huge build volume like this, I think this might be the best one at under $1,000. But if you don't need a huge build volume, if you don't need to be printing nylon and polycarbonate prints, then there are cheaper and easier to use printers out there. The bamboo printers are way easier to swap filaments with, and I think the Creality K1 printers have a much easier to use menus, and you still get that full clipper control. Currently it is on sale for $950. I will have some links in the description down below. So I think for a lot of people, this is an amazing machine that can do some great things that other printers can't do at this price point. But for me, PLA filament, some PETG, and the occasional ABS print is really all the strength that I need out of my prints. And I would rather use a more convenient machine with a few less features. But what do you think about this printer? Is there a use case that I haven't thought about? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Now go out there, create something amazing, and I'll see you in the next video.